Hi, my name is Mary Spender and welcome to Series 2, Episode 2 of Tuesday Talks. This series will consist of 10 interviews in total with some of my favourite musicians. You can watch the interview in full here on YouTube, but if you prefer just to listen, then you can also download the podcast, which is available everywhere now. This week I chat to Rick Beato, who is a producer, multi-instrumentalist, an incredibly engaging music teacher with over 1 million subscribers on YouTube. This whole series is brought to you by DistroKid, my favourite music distribution service, which gets your music into online stores and streaming platforms, and there is a link in the description for you to get 7% off your first year. So I would love you to comment below and share your favourite moments of this conversation, maybe leaving a timestamp or quote. But first, let's get into the show. Tuesday, 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 Tuesday talks. So I saw you briefly at Nam, but how was your Nam? It was pretty good. Um, it's difficult, as you know, when you are on YouTube and people know who you are, and they come up to you all the time. It's uh, it's hard to get around, but it's fun. And it's great seeing people like you that I only see once a year, <laughs> and uh, and all of our YouTube friends. That's that's to me that's the most fun part of it. Seeing you know being there with Rhett and and Paul and and Adam and Tim Pierce, all, all of my uh, all all of my friends, all my YouTuber friends, Marty, everybody, Brett. It's great. Anyone you don't shout out now will just be offended. Well, I'm I was just trying to think of I was just trying to think who else was there. It, it was just so much fun hanging out in that community and actually being able to uh, talk shop. Um, but everyone's experience is so different. It's just just kind of cool. It was it was fun though. Nam was Nam was great. It was great. Did you see any gear that you're thinking about acquiring? Um, I saw a couple interesting things. I saw this uh, modeling microphone that was interesting by Townsend Company. Um, I saw um, I saw the new Neural DSP um, plugin, but I didn't get to, did get to try it out. But um, I saw Tosin Abbasi's uh, guitars, and I didn't get to play those because there were just so many people around. Tos Tosin said, "Oh, come over, come over and play." I said, "No, I don't." play it's too much uh too much commotion to to go in there and play they're getting very popular everybody's got their their phones on to a anyone that's playing everybody's filming everything so i know which is absolutely terrifying um <laughs> i didn't i didn't really get to do as much playing as i hoped because it was all a bit overwhelming as you know and um but I did get to wander around with the um was it air headphones just to get like a bit of like personal me time so that no one really no one could hear what I was doing because <laughs> I, I realized like how little I'd played guitar in the run-up um just you know I just feel like you have to be prepared with certain tunes or licks or something when you're going into Nam just in case someone has their camera out <laughs> yeah, everybody's got all their whole, their whole, you know, all the people that are really wanting to play. They're the ones that have everything worked out that they've been practicing for uh, six months, <laughs> getting ready for Nam. Yeah, the, they'll do this famous saying where it's like, oh, I don't practice. I just play. And you're like, yeah, but you've done some practice for this. We all know. We all know. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Okay, so one of the themes that I'm really interested in talking about is education obviously um and it sort of stems from uh a personal thing that happened when I was about seven years old and I was auditioning for a music school not not a not a conservatoire or like a dedicated music school but they I was applying for a music scholarship at a at a, a prep school uh, in Salisbury um, and it was the cathedral school so it was pretty tough going and I actually failed to get in the choir twice which was my first failure <laughs> actually I think I had I think I had musical failures before then actually um, but we've all had a Mary oh I know I know but I started very young <laughs> um, and I remember so my parents aren't musical 
And I think they were just trying to navigate this world where I was really interested in it. I was showing a lot of um, gusto, I would say. Um, and there was a there was a moment where my dad, I'm probably going to get the story wrong, but my dad is a worrier. Like he worries about things. He'll hear something. He won't ask questions about it. Instead, he'll just worry about it and then tell me later. And um, I didn't get into the choir and got the letter and everything sort of saying why. And they were saying my voice was too low. But it, I think it was actually... Uh, one, I just wasn't good enough, which is fair. And I wish they'd just said that too. But um, in terms of sight reading and all that sort of stuff. But also, I think um, the the term, obviously, perfect pitch is like this elusive, magical thing in, in um, to me in classical music because of not having it um, and sort of being outdone by children who were the same age as me, but did have perfect pitch and had musical parents. So is there anything that you would recommend to parents that aren't musical, but their kids are showing some sign of it, um, how to get them into training when music programs all over the country, especially in the US, or all over the world really, are being shut down because of budget cuts? Well, I mean, ultimately we're, responsible for our kids education whether we need to um, take matters into our own hands I have three kids and I uh, when my two kids went into elementary school Dylan was in kindergarten or was in first grade and Lennon was in kindergarten I got on the school board at the school that they went to and I did that for three years and I uh, ran the academic committee so I that, that was the way that I got involved with making sure that my kids' education, that I had as much say in their education as possible. So um, not everybody is as ambitious as that may be. Uh, my, my wife said to me, uh, we need to get more involved in school this year. And I said, you mean I do? And she said, yeah. <laughs> so you really did. <laughs> I did. So I did. And um and it was really instructive. Uh, the The school that they went to was a language immersion school, and um, and I'd never been on a school board before. I was a college professor in my twenties, um, music professor. But uh, you know, people talk about school boards being really political, but this was a great. The people were incredibly nice, and and it was a really it was a great experience. And um, so. This is a charter school, and in Georgia, we don't have particularly high taxation at the state level. And, uh, you know, the schools may not be as good as other places in the north that have higher taxes and they can pay teachers more. That's a generalization, but there's a lot of great charter schools here. And that was a charter school, which are typically done by lottery. And, um, you know, but you're ultimately responsible for your kids' education. Whether you have to homeschool them, get extra tutoring, um, get them into a charter school. If, if, you know, like I said, charter schools are public schools, so they're funded by the state here in the United States. And, um, and you just have to, you know, put in the time and, and the work to do that for your kids, I think. That's, that's you know, that's my f philosophy. And, um, and, uh, <clears throat> So that's that's uh, you got you got to do it yourself. You can't rely on on other people to educate your kids. Luckily, my parents were pretty. Um, they they fought my corner quite a few times. That's what I'll say. Um, in terms of music, do you think there's any anything specific that people can get involved in? Um, I think that all kids should take music lessons beginning when they're about four years old. Uh, typically, that. Kids that have early music training, kids that develop perfect pitch invariably have music, early music training beginning around, typically around four years of age. Uh, the note labeling, I mean, as far as actual perfect pitch where you can identify a note instantly, only babies can develop that, but, but there's, you can have it and not develop the labeling part of it. And the labeling 
typically comes that comes through experience and being able to associate the sounds with um with the particular actual note uh if i you know you hear bah, you know that oh that's a g and that it only comes from labeling that note as a child as a baby really or as a ch young child and typically through taking lessons so that was kind of a long answer to that mary but yeah no it's good it's, it's this is a long form piece of content um <laughs> um yeah i i worried my dad he didn't when i think i said something to him in retaliation one time where i was like i don't have perfect pitch um he thought that that meant i was going to be a bad musician which luckily hopefully is not true and obviously is not necessary for people to you know have flourishing music careers um how about sort of teenagers or adults who are sort of starting to take ownership of their own education or you know any age really um in terms of music like navigating the online space and just knowing where to start obviously choosing an instrument helps um choosing a type of music um but do you think there are uh, it's sort of it's quite difficult to sort of focus where to begin now with everything being put out i think yeah it's, i think it's very difficult now as opposed to when i was a child there was no internet and um and music was a fun recreational thing, especially for teenagers, people that wanted to play in bands. Um, that was just really uh, a great, great experience. And I picked up the guitar. I loved the sound of the guitar. And um, I wanted to take lessons. And, and my friends that were musicians wanted to do it back then. Now kids are, are really um, bombarded with things like video games and it's more difficult for them to focus on learning an instrument, I think. Um, and it's, I think it's, I think the kids, uh, I think it's a really important thing to have, especially people that, you know, teenagers that play in groups, whatever kind of group it is that, that work together with other with other people and you learn how to um, interact with people in a, in a business setting, if you will. I mean, that's kind of what being in a band is or something or doing a, you know, recording a project. It's kind of like being running a business. Actually, you get together and rehearse, you make decisions like a corporation would or whatever. You know, it's it's uh, it's it's really great uh, for kids to do that. I remember. I played in cover bands when I first started playing guitar and okay, here's our set list. The drummer was the one that told everybody, here's the songs we're going to learn, go home and learn them, come back to practice. You know, it's like, uh, this is your job this week. You go do it and you listen to the songs you're playing it wrong. What are you talking about? I'm playing it right. You know, uh, that is a great experience for kids. I think for anybody. So very, very, you know, it, it's important. And, uh, and, uh, but as far as what genre of music to play, I mean, just whatever, you know, whatever people are, are interested in, whatever kind of music is uh, you're passionate about, I think is important. Yeah, I think that's really valuable. And I, I sort of even now get overwhelmed with where I should be going, where should I where I should be self-educating and um, or even where to actually find someone to help me with the certain things that I want to be learning and improving on but um being in a band <laughs> at school I was the drummer <laughs> so I was the one <laughs> dictating it was a dictatorship most definitely and um I made a few firings by by the age of 15 I I think I fired two drummers <laughs> there you go that's a big yeah. part of it Mary is is that uh you have to do stuff like that. Invariably, you end up firing your best friends and things, and and it's always a bad, always a bad scene. It's always bad. I I ended up luckily. I'm still very close friends with um, uh, someone I was in a in a band with. But I left the band. I knew that I wanted to fire all of them, so I just went and started started my own. Oh God, I took it. I took it way too seriously. <laughs> It's a great real world experience, though, that because the idea of firing people that happens in bands, it actually does. Yeah, it really does. Yeah. 
people quit, people get fired, you know, they can't cut it, they don't show up to practice, whatever. And it's like running a business. If somebody, if you're some, one of your employees isn't showing up to work, get rid of them. Yeah, absolutely. If you don't turn up to rehearsal on time, then you're going to get the sack. That's right. Or, or if you can't chip in on the rehearsal space, you know. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Um, it's actually pretty funny in terms of community, in terms of what I feel like YouTubers are building um obviously within their own audiences but in terms of uh the nam environment or uh getting to collaborate with people um all around the world what i'm realizing is that the best way to learn new stuff is to watch the people i admire and their content and what they're you know they're my new educators so I get to be educated by my friends now, which is really, really cool. And then obviously those YouTubers feel like friends to their whole audience. So yeah, I think I was feeling a little bit maybe like people could be potentially closed off, but actually with the internet, they're more able to access um, people, you know, quicker than ever and and different ideas and Obviously, if those ideas are controversial, people will find out about it. <laughs> um, if it's wrong, uh, people will most definitely tell you in the comments. So, <laughs> of course, they will. it's all it's all really interesting. Did you expect this to be how you'd be spending your time? No. What did you think you'd be doing? I I pr I thought I'd just continue to produce bands and. And uh, that fateful day when Rhett came in after he'd been interning here for five years and you should start a YouTube channel. Like, what? The, the interesting thing was I thought a lot about the uh, things that he told me to do when I first started it. He told me channels to watch. And none of them were music channels. They were all science channels, things like that. And um, or Casey Neistat vlogging things, you know, um, Lot photography channels, science channels, Smarter Every Day, Veritasium, um, a lot of videos like that, Vsauce. And I, one, once I saw how videos were made, I, it was fascinating because it uh, really influenced the, the early videos that I did. And um, I was influenced by... I, I did more vlog oriented videos at the beginning. Now my, my videos are more straight teaching for the most part, but always trying to tell a story. That's, that's really the, I think that's the key to doing well on YouTube. Um, I think just, it's interesting, more interesting to people when you tell stories. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think um, it's interesting that you say that about other types of channels, because that's how I, suddenly realized oh wait is there a music community because I was watching Casey Neistat's vlogs every day um when he was really really super consistent for like the first 400 days at 8 a.m New York time it was 1 1 p.m uh UK time and I was on my lunch break in my data entry finance job <laughs> and I'd I'd uh I'd watch his videos and just be like oh my god I really you know, that was when he had like maybe half a million subscribers, which is crazy when you think about, you know, where you've got to now and just, yeah, I think um, that's, I guess that's almost the dilemma with YouTube. You have to learn how to make videos if you want to talk about music or if you want to talk about anything on YouTube, you have to be able to tell a story. Um, and it's, it's almost more important to be able to do that and communicate that than actually even being able to play an instrument now. You know, I thought when I would watch Casey and I saw he had millions of subscribers and I kept thinking to myself, he must get so nervous before he hits the publish button because it's going to go out to all these people. And one video, he said that, that he, he hits the public or he said something like, I hit the publish button like everyone else. And then... You know, if your channel does well, uh, you, you know, you get 50,000, 100,000 subscribers or more, then you realize that you don't think about those things. It just is kind of a, you just do your thing. And I just keep making videos as if I've got a few thousand people that, that watch them. I don't really, I don't think about 
you know that uh, there's a large group of larger group of people that are interested. That's interesting because I I I do think about it. Well, I don't think about the number. I just think about um, I get the sort of like butterfly. It's 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 a bit like walking on stage or something. Like you know, it's not going to hurt you. You know, if you've done a good job with the video and actually spent time on it, which I'm only just starting to do now, now that I can, you know, the last year has been the first time I've actually been full time and able to um, spend days rather than just an evening on a video. But um, I still I still get a I still get a flutter, (laughs) a flutter of nerves. (laughs) But then when a video does do well, it's strange because it's like it's yes, I did my job. I'm glad this reached people. But then it's almost like a, it's it's kind of like an empty feeling at the same time because you're like, well, I've just got to do the next one. <laughs> you know, I when I look back at how many videos I've made and it's over 700, and every time I start a video, Mary, I think, ah, oh, it takes so long to make a video. I don't know why I still always think the same thing. I dread starting. Once I start, it's fine, but I dread sitting down and doing that first shot and importing it into the computer, you know? And uh, and I think to myself, I can't believe that I've made this many videos. Every time I upload one, it's, it's such a relief to be done with it. Um, and... Uh, and you, you realize how much work is involved. And then when you go, how many video, how many videos have you made? Do you know how many? Definitely not as many as you. Um, I think it's over to maybe 250. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. It's, um, uh, it's, but if you think back to the work involved in every one of those though, it's, it's mind boggling. I remember when I, I watched, I used to like to watch people that were doing their YouTube burnout videos. Those were some of my favorites. Remember, I remember because I always love to hear how, you know, Superwoman or Andrew Wong when he did his YouTuber burnout video and and when they would talk about how much time it takes to make a video, it always made me feel good because I would say to myself, Ex- oh, exactly, oh, I know that feeling and uh, how hard it is and it always made me feel better that other people felt the same way as that I did. So, uh, YouTuber burnout is definitely a thing, but, um, but it's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of work, but it's very fun. I love doing it. I definitely agree. Burnout is definitely a thing, but it just, it's, it's not unique to YouTubers. No. So... You know, everyone reaches that point in their jobs, whether it's a day job or whether it's a career, and they just go, what the hell am I doing? (laughs) Because the rewards you dream up in your head change um, or just aren't anywhere close. Um, So I've been, and and I was sort of facing it with, uh, in terms of my procrastination level, that reaches sky high when I have a deadline. I will do everything. Suddenly my house will be really, really clean. Uh, My laundry will be done. The dishes will be washed. Um, Then I'll start doing admin bits and bobs that don't need to be done and not urgent. I'll find every excuse to not make the video. Um, But then it's, it's about sort of coming up with ways one to be alone with the work so don't think about all the other stuff and i guess it's sort of it it's better when you have something like um maybe a a slightly longer term project overarching everything that you kind of learn that patience where you're like well no one's going to do this for me unless i put all my energy behind it like no one's ringing me in the morning saying where are you at 9 a.m which used to happen because i used to miss my you know first meeting or sleep in late or something awful when I was 20 and uh, in jobs at university but um, I, I just think when you're 
alone with it and you realize like how much you actually love making videos and don't worry about all the other stuff it becomes a lot easier um and it's why I, I wanted to restart Tuesday talks in this way because I was just like I miss talking to people like I enjoy making videos by myself and I enjoy telling stories that way about a certain piece of gear or something like that but really the whole foundation of my channel was having a conversation with someone feeling inspired by them and motivated just to keep on keeping on because everyone is feeling exactly the same way um so yeah also i i do have the sort of weekly reminder my mum is a nurse in the nhs over here and uh you know i get to make youtube videos <laughs> it's just like it's just incredible and i don't and actually learning when someone, I know so many people uh, have family members in, in the NHS or um, are working as nurses, doctors or um, anything, which is just a difficult job uh, mentally, not just creatively. Um, I know that they actually see the importance of what we're doing in a way too. So that's quite nice to remind myself that I'm not just doing something whimsical and, and, um, ethereal and, and idiotic. It's like, it, it means something to somebody, even if you're just sort of inspiring someone to pick up their guitar or, or listen to a new record or something like that. It's just making their life a little bit brighter. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, I'm lucky because I've got Rhett, that lives 25 minutes from here, 20 minutes away. And we, 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 uh, you know, go out and have lunch together, you know, once a week, he comes over and makes a video at least once a week with me and Dave Honorado, you know, the three of us, or, or I have my old assistant, Ken come in. He was, he's been in a bunch of videos or my buddy, Jack, who's a drummer or, or Les Hall who plays bass and piano and everything else. I mean, I've got all these friends that have been in multiple videos of mine and it, that's, you know, it's always something different. I always got something on the horizon like that and get to work with players, um, with other musicians to do this. And that that's been a fun thing with the channel is that it retained kind of what the, my music production uh, life was like where it was always musicians coming in and playing different things and different projects that that's been really fun I'm, I'm fortunate to have people that are like Rhett that's a youtuber that live you know that we work together on stuff all the time that's that's been uh that's been cool so um so that it's not as isolated of an existence that does actually lead me on to a patreon question while we're sort of talking about it because uh, Chris asks, do you think solo artists, musicians who do it all themselves will be the standard way of creating music in the future? Or if regular band setups will start to reoccur, it seems hard for people on social media to form bands. I, would I go near record companies? Well, you don't need record companies as, as you, you know, you see from YouTube that YouTube is the only social media platform. If it, if it, even is one. I'm not even sure it is, but um, where they go out and find your audience for you. I mean, I mean, in a sense, Instagram does through hashtags, but it's not the same thing. YouTube actually matches people who have the same interests that look up the same topics as what you make in your videos. Um, if you're doing original music, though, that's trickier because typically the only way to get your music out to a big audience you can through youtube but you can't really do it through making videos about of your music you have to have your channel be about something beyond what what your what your band is so getting playlisted on spotify or or apple music is still incredibly important and record labels control that for the most part it's really difficult it can be done, you know, it can, it can be done. So to answer that question, would I go near record labels? Well, every big artist that you see on the Grammys or wherever, they're all on major record labels still, for the most part. Not Chance the Rapper, I guess, but I mean, there's there are exceptions, but generally people 
even if they have success on their own, they eventually go to majors because there are doors that they can open because they're big corporations that you just can't, you know, there's not nothing you can do about it. I am, I am fully aware of the power they hold. Um, and in terms of like going near record companies, if you want to be a music YouTuber, then you just obviously most definitely don't need to. Um, but yeah, it's, it is strange that record labels are, they've turned themselves around and, you know, they are actually signing people who already have audiences. So it's like, do you become, if you have no other option, you kind of have to jump on these platforms, whether it's YouTube or whether it's Instagram. But what you were saying about YouTube is really, really interesting. And it's something I've never thought about. It is the only one that does search for your audience for you. Yes. They're, they're, it's a, YouTube is your publicist, basically. They go out and, and connect you with your audience. And nothing, nothing, uh, no other platform does that. I mean, how do you do that on Instagram, really? Well, you put in hashtags, but the hashtags are pretty random. People that follow hashtags, I don't follow any hashtags. Um, I just don't. I mean, occasionally I'll click on a video that, on the suggested videos that are there. If I see something interesting, I mean, you never hear them. So you'll see a bunch of stuff and it's all music stuff for me. That's all I watch. They know that at least. They don't serve me up any, you know, cat videos or anything. <laughs> My kids watch plenty of cat videos. They, they get a lot of them in their feed. But, uh, uh, yeah, YouTube is, I don't know, Is I'll ask you, Mary, is YouTube a social media platform? I would say no. I'd say no. It doesn't, it doesn't feel like it. Um, it has people, um, so it's social in that aspect, and... But but and and the way we talk to our audiences is quite social. But no, I just no, I don't think it is. It's like a TV. It's like uh, watching TV. It's a network. Yeah, it's a network. Yeah. Yeah. And I actually think that's what's getting so interesting about it is that it is if you if you start to think of it as a TV network and how you want to program you know, certain series and certain things like that. I think it's only going to get more sophisticated from their end too, because they're going to want to compete with other streaming platforms. Yeah, they're user-generated content, as well as obviously working with networks and, and featuring sort of the guys with, you know, money behind them and and um, uh, slightly more sort of uh, power in the traditional sense. Um, it's It's just going to get... It's going to get really, really interesting. And I think their power is letting people upload what they want um, and let them reach their audiences. And, and they're trying to make it work, you know, when people are complaining about the algorithm or whatever. You're like, well, it's part of the game. Maybe it would be a network head um, that would say that your TV series idea sucked. And it's like, that's kind of what it's doing when when your video absolutely flops. Their algorithm tells you when your content's not good, you know. It's much easier to blame it on the algorithm than it is on a person that, you know, you don't want to annoy too much. Like the algorithm at least can't hear you bad mouthing it. <laughs> I never think, you know, people talk about the algorithm all the time. And I, I did a talk at Berkeley last week up in Boston. And uh, people were asking me about that, about the algorithm. And I said, you know. What is it? I, the algorithm? I don't really think about that. You know, if you make a good video, typically it does really well. And if you don't make a good video, it doesn't do that well. I mean, sometimes I've made videos that I think are good and they don't get they don't do that well. But but I think ultimately they'll find an audience. Sometimes I'll, I'll make something and then, you know, a couple of weeks after it comes out, it'll it'll out of the out of nowhere, just pick up or something. But I've had that with videos that have been on on my channel for years like suddenly one of it will get one of them will get recommended and that's where even if it doesn't hit straight away and blow up it's like it's all about having a library of material and you know having a back catalog that will just sit there and the views will never go down unless they're fake which they're not so if that it, it will always start building and that's that's where i found with um my video on the anechoic chamber it blew up and it was my first video to really do really, really well. Um, but it it didn't go over a million until 
almost six months later, maybe, maybe more. Um, so it's just like, just, just let it do its thing and just be alone with the work because that, that is definitely the part that you cannot control at all. I, you know, a lot, a lot of videos I was looking today. Um, I had a video go over a million that I did, I don't know, probably eight months ago or so, uh, today. And then I was looking, um, and I had nine other videos or something like that that are over 900,000 that are going to, that, you know, eventually it'll take months to go over a million, but I've, I have a lot, I have a bunch of videos over a million, I don't know, 30 videos, something like that over a million views. But, um, you know, some of the things, a lot of these, when you do a lot of videos, you don't, you don't ever go back and look at them or how they do or anything. You never see the comments. And then occasionally you'll sort by, by views and you look and say, Oh, that one's close to a million or that, Oh, that hit 2 million or whatever. And, and, uh, Ones that I know did not do well when they first came out. They just didn't. So um, so I don't think too much about it when I when I put the things out. Like I said, there sometimes if you do long videos, I typically do long videos and people um, have to spend the time. You know they have to set aside 25 minutes or whatever to to watch a video, something like that. And, and uh, so I don't know. But... I got way off topic there. Sorry. It's just about just continue to upload because eventually those videos will be seen. It doesn't matter whether or not they go over a million. It's like even a hundred thousand views. It's just so many people. And really by this point, you know that people aren't really rewatching videos over and over. Um, and you don't have the time to watch your own videos over and over. So they'll eventually that's you know that's that's a hundred thousand individuals so if you imagine that in a stadium for every video let alone a million people yeah it's exciting i think it's exciting and especially the fact that we're talking about three years ago and how how much smaller everyone's channels were and and just sort of tech developments and cameras getting better and the platform getting better and who knows where we'll be in another three years? Yeah, uh, things that happened in the last eight months or so that when you upload, when you would upload a 4K video, you know, even four months ago, you'd have to wait for an hour, or two hours till it rendered in 4K. You know, it'd be at a lower quality first. Now they have that worked out to where it's instantaneously in 4K. So um, they keep, YouTube keeps imp improving the platform, which is great. I think that that's a, that's been a really positive thing. I don't have, I don't have any, I don't complain about YouTube at all. I don't, I don't, um, I don't know anyone at YouTube. Uh, and, you know, I think the platform's amazing. I'm really, um, really psyched to be part of it. And, and um, I go, I watch YouTube all the time anyways. Anytime I want to learn anything, I go to YouTube every day. Like what do I want to learn about? It's always, you know, cameras, lights, whatever, whatever it is, you know. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm so happy with the platform. Like, again, I also get questions or it's just like, are you worried about this? And it's just like, well, YouTube is definitely here to stay. Like you look at the infrastructure, it's got Google behind it. Is anyone ever worried about Google disappearing? Absolutely not. Everyone knows how mammoth they are. And they're clever, you know, they're smart. Even if things do change, doesn't matter. The more worrying thing is us making good content that still relates to our audience or, you know, making sure we can still keep making videos. That's the more worrying aspect of YouTube channels or anyway. Anyway, I digress as well. But I, I have a few prepped questions because um, so... Uh, I kind of want to, I want to switch this one up a bit and sort of say music, but also book as well. So which album or artist have you recommended to your friends and family the most? I typically don't recommend things. I only, per I have six siblings and the only person, the only sibling I recommend things to is my younger brother, John. He's a really good guitar player. So I'm constantly sending him people off Instagram or YouTube that I find. And he always says, oh, I already know, I already follow them. Every one of them. I already, oh, come on. I already follow them. 
Or he says something like, oh, they're a way better player than you are. <laughs> that's, that's his stock... That's his stock response and everything, and I always, I always laugh. I think it's great. But I constantly, every day, we're sending each other videos. So I found my brother John has found so many people for me to check out. So that's a that's a real big thing in our family. And my my next older brother Ray as well. He's he's always kind of been on the cutting edge and kept up with with new music and uh, and will send me YouTubers, Instagrammers, things like that. Um, or tell me what I should be making videos on. That's the other thing. Or how come you didn't say this on this video or that on that video? Um, so that's cool. So I, 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 it's kind of in reverse in my family. They always recommend things to me. In terms of, do you, do you read often? Do you have time to read? I read every day. What kind of things do you read? I typically read, um, I read politics every day. Um, I never talk about politics, but I read about politics all day, every day. <laughs> I mean, I no, I, I spend an inordinate amount of time on politics, hours a day. <laughs> I read about politics and current events constantly. Do you read any fiction? Um... I mean, I know politics can be fiction sometimes. Yeah, but. <laughs> yeah I, I, read, I read politics. <laughs> um, I, uh, I don't, you know, I don't really have a lot of time to read. I wish that I did. When with uh, with three little kids, I get my days start at five thirty a.m. Getting up with my kids, my wife and kids, and making breakfast and lunch for them, and and uh, driving my two girls to school. And uh, that's that's two hours, three hours before I even get down to the studio and start work, working on stuff. So I have very long days. So I typically will do the reading that I do or current events, and it's always in the evenings. So, but I I but but it's but it's really um, but but I constantly am on Twitter uh, on. I watch TV. I read. Uh, I follow a lot of writers, um, and mainly keep up with current events. So it's important to be an engaged citizen. At least it's important to me. Well, I think that's good, and that that I guess kind of feeds into your video process in terms of uh, talking about music and what's current and and how it works and. All that sort of stuff. But, um, okay, second question. If you had, uh, if you could have a drink with any musician dead or alive, who would it be and what would you ask them? Probably Paul McCartney. Um, and I would ask Paul how they wrote, when they had time to write all these amazing songs in such a short window of time, essentially from really 64 to 70 you know, a hundred, two hundred songs that they wrote that were ninety nine percent of them were phenomenally great songs, and it just it blows my mind that you know, when did they do this? They were uber famous. How could they focus on doing this? And uh, I'm, I've always been fascinated by that. So, yeah, I mean, it just I I. I always obsess about that. I know how hard it is to write a song, let alone write so many phenomenally great songs. And I mean, I would say the same thing if I met Mick Jagger and Keith Richards and and Pete Townsend and you know all the old school rockers that I grew up listening to uh, that are still alive. There's not, you know, they're, you know, we're losing them every day. And and um, uh, but of the ones that are still living. There's many things I'd like to ask them, and that's why I try to do as, do as many interviews on my channel as possible, especially with with musicians that I really respect. So, um, tell me about your favorite piece of music gear or piece of tech. So it doesn't actually have to be musical, and the story behind it. Uh, my 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 favorite piece of music tech is um, is this right here. I'll show it to you. I guess it's not really music tech but it's it's this this is my 
This is my 1957 Gibson Country and Western acoustic. It's really the only acoustic I have. I have a classical that I've, that's, that I've had since 1977. But I bought this guitar in 1999. Um, I used it on a record in 1998 that a mixer and, and producer named Kevin Shirley, who's a fantastic engineer and producer, he does all Joe Bonamassa's records, but he's done Aerosmith records and... A lot, a lot of people. He's South African. Um, he heard this. He mixed a record of mine years ago, in probably in 99. And he said, that is the best sounding acoustic I've ever heard on a record. Is that your guitar? And I said, no, it's the guy that owns the studio that we recorded at. He said, you should buy that guitar. So I said, I, my buddy Jimmy owned it. He owned the studio that one of my old bands recorded at. And uh, kept asking him, come on, Jimmy, you want to sell me that guitar, will you? Sell me that? No, no, I'm never going to sell that guitar. Never going to sell it. You know, every every few months I'd call him up. So I was signed to a major label back in '98, '99, and um, and they gave us a budget because we were doing a lot of radio things, and they gave us a budget of three thousand dollars. Me and the singer of my band to uh, to buy acoustic guitars, and uh, we didn't have any budget for anything like that. I would never. I couldn't afford three thousand dollars on a guitar and and i said jimmy i got three thousand bucks can i uh let me let me buy that guitar and he needed the money then and he sold it to me so um i've uh, recorded this on countless albums and um my biggest video that i have on my channel the top 20 acoustic guitar intros of all time i did on this guitar and and uh, this is my definitely my favorite piece of music gear in the studio where there's a lot of gear in here. So, but this is w without a doubt the uh, no question my favorite piece of, of gear. With a great story behind it. That's very cool. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, final question. If you could give your younger self a word of musical advice, what would it be? do whatever I did. <laughs> that is what I like about you. I feel, you know, it, it, you get to a certain point with musicians of any age, like my, some of my friends are already talking about their teenage years being their heyday when really you don't want that to happen at all. You want to be living in the present at all times and like being able to, you know, every bad decision you ever made makes up your story now so that's a very cool answer thank you yeah i'm i'm uh, i i wouldn't change a thing that's a perfect way to end i appreciate it mary thanks uh, thanks for coming on thanks for your time absolutely my pleasure it's great to great to be with you today Rick is a truly fascinating guy, so I hope you enjoyed our conversation. Make sure you subscribe to his channel and check out all his videos, but also take a moment to find out more about the sponsor of this series. More than 250,000 artists rely on DistroKid to distribute their music, including myself. If you're wanting to have your music available on Spotify, iTunes, Apple Music and Tidal, amongst many more stores, then you should sign up using the link in the description. An account starts at just $19.99 for unlimited songs and albums in 12 months. And with the link in the description, you'll get 7% off your first year. DistroKid can split earnings from any song or album and automatically send those earnings to your collaborators. Think how much easier that makes life for you and your band or that producer that might have given you a discount in exchange for a percentage of sales. You can add an unlimited number of collaborators to any track. You can change the splits at any time and for privacy, collaborators can only see what percentage they get. If they haven't created an account, it won't delay your release. DistroKid will hold on to the money until they join. And as always, DistroKid doesn't take a cut out of your royalties. For independent musicians, it's necessary to stay on top of your finances and avoid any disagreements. Protect yourself and your songs. Massive thanks to DistroKid for making this series possible and check out the link in the description again. So, see you next week.